reading today. We have a special verse that is in the third John chapter one, verse two, and it says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Now I would like to invite Geraldine up here, please. We'd like to ask her a few questions. So um so, um, <laughs> Ulysses is going to ask you the first question. So, Geraldine, can you tell us a bit about your last name and how to pronounce it? So. Oh, yeah, I've, I've got oh, a microphone got here. Can you hear me on this? Yes. 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 So, it's Prisbilko. Okay. And I'm married to uh, Daniel Prisbilko, who's Polish. And he's a pastor at, uh, can you just uh, yeah, share that with us? Yeah, Church and Parramatta Central Church Plant. Thank you. Well, I um, just before I've, I've asked, pa well, Pastor's going to ask a few more questions, but um, I actually didn't know <laughs> Geraldine until um, I did the earlier wellness. You know, some of us did the earlier wellness um, Live More project with Darren Morton, and I saw your little video clip and all that sort of stuff. And then Amelda, who's from our church, she's at the camp at the moment. Um, she suggested. We couldn't, we were thinking of someone, and then she said, oh, let's get Geraldine <laughs> to come to our church. Um, we really appreciate your ministry, um, but I know you're going to be sharing a little bit more um, during your presentation and your, your sermon. But, um, yeah, I, I, I know that you've got your master's and your PhD in a lot of different things, but we're not going to go there. Um, but we know, I, well, I know, or I can see um, from what I've heard, um, that you are a very spiritual lady, I have to admit. Um, so I really appreciate, you know, you coming here today. But I'm going to ask Pastor to maybe ask you questions about where you're working and all that sort of thing about your role as well. Pastor? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, well, I want to welcome uh, Geraldine. Uh, Geraldine, uh, I have known Geraldine for a number of years, quite a number of years, Geraldine. Um, Geraldine didn't start out as a spiritual girl at all. When I met her first, <laughs> she was fairly secular. That's True? Correct. Absolutely. True? Yes. Um, but um, when I was at Waitara, her parents, particularly her mother, came to a series of meetings that I was made. Even though her mother had been brought up as an Adventist, she had left the church and... Um, for many, many years. I don't know how many years, Geraldine, but many 30, years. 30 years. 30 years, okay. And Geraldine was a product of that uh, period out that she was outside the church, she and her sister. And uh, so I met her one day when she came to church. I happened to be going over to London at that time, and we met again while I was in London. Um, and then when Geraldine came back, we continued our association together, trying to encourage the whole family, actually, to become Adventists. And so far, mother has been baptised, and father still is struggling. <laughs> he's, he's, he's getting there. <laughs> he's getting there, yes. And my sister's just got baptised last year. Yes, and that's a wonderful mm. thing, too. Is she still in New York? She is. Yes. Doing very well. Okay. And um, then Geraldine went to um, Louis Torres's program over in um, Guam. There's many other things that happened over the years. I'm just giving you, we're not here to spend all our time talking about this. But uh, while she was in Guam working there at the hospital, um, she also attended the, um, the, uh, the training school that he was conducting. And it was at that particular time that I remember Geraldine and I talking lots about the possibility of her marrying Daniel. And um, she was um, not 100% certain that that was the way to go. And um, as sometimes we often do in our relationships with one another. Um, but eventually um, they made a decision and then I had the privilege of being involved in her wedding which was held at Darling Harbour. I don't know how many years ago, Geraldine, but a few years ago now. Yeah, 2011. 2011. I knew you'd remember that. <laughs> um, 2011. And uh, then Geraldine 
um, as I said, married Daniel. Um, they've got a little seven-year-old seven-year-old girl, and she's lovely, um, as you can appreciate. And um, as well as that, uh, Geraldine now has been offered the position in the division in the health department. And how long have you been working there? A number of years too. Since 2015, 16. Okay. Yeah. And uh, tr what Trudy said is now part of what Geraldine does. And I'm sure we're going to appreciate uh, very much her presentation this morning. And uh, it's marvellous just to see the, the difference in and what's happened over those uh, 10 or 12 years and, and, and see how, by God's grace, she has, is here today from where she was. So, Geraldine, welcome to Stanmore. Thank this you. is a very, very important church, one of the oldest churches, as you can see. We just celebrated a couple of years ago, 120 years, and we're coming up to 125. So uh, we have great um, pride in the history of this church. And this pulpit is where Ellen White preached from herself. So um, we, uh, we love the th to think about the history, although we're not only looking back, we're looking forward. And I'm sure this morning's service is going to help us along the line. Thank you, Geraldine. Thank you, Pastor Yudin. What he didn't share with you was that he actually baptised me in 2007. So when my, I came to God in the UK, one of the places, I was working at Barclays Bank at the time, and there was nobody that I knew that went to church out of 5,000 people in the core centres, etc. It's become a very secular place. And uh, so I was thinking, I wanted to get ba baptised at Waitara Church, so I came and, and I asked uh, Pastor Jeff Yudin, and uh, he was he baptised me, and I just want to recognise Lynn as well. Uh, thank you for her influences uh, with that. And it was such a joy to be able to come to Guam. Je uh, Pastor Jeff was doing a big evangelistic series for us at the University of Guam, and it was such a joy to do that uh, together and support him in the work. Well, today I want to thank you for the privilege of being here. Uh, it's actually, it feels like uh, home church because I turned around and I saw these familiar faces and I thought, wow, uh, even someone I hadn't seen for such a long time was up sitting at the back, uh, Sasha, and uh, great to see you as well. So thank you for inviting me. And I do want to say here that Trudy has given me such a warm welcome. I think she's must have communicated to me at least, I don't know, eight, ten times. And I just wanted to say that she's, every church needs a Trudy. <laughs> so, hey, let's be, before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your mercy. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross that we would have life and live it more abundantly. And Lord, may I decrease as you increase. And I pray that uh, you will bless the words that come from my mouth, Lord, and I pray that we will not leave the same way we came. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I might just move it over here only because of the, the feed. So there are many, so I've titled this the United Work. There are many learnings we can obtain from animals. We talked about animals uh, very slightly at, in the Sabbath school lesson. And I would like to share with you a few, few things this morning. These Cape buffaloes are part of the African five uh, animals, big five animals. They live in herds of 50 to 500. And uh, they, the reason why they do that is to actually discourage predators. When confronted, the strong buffaloes form a united front to protect the rest of the herd, the, the males, the females, and also the young. And it's interesting that somehow these stronger buffaloes linger around the sick to ensure that they are protected until they regain their strength. Isn't that amazing? So one of the learnings here is that they have a clear vision, and that is to protect their herd, and they're united in their work. And that's a lesson for us as well. We look here in, in Romans, in Romans 15 verse 5, it talks about, now may the God of... Oh. You can't be sleeping so early. Now may the God of patience, patience and grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to 
Jesus Christ. It's not my will, it's God's will. And it's how we can do things to edify God and his work. There are over 12,000 ant species. Each species lives in colonies that accommodate up to a million ants, consisting of a queen, female workers, male workers uh, as well. Ants must be relentlessly focused on gathering their food supplies. They must work as a team and diligently prepare for survival during the winter, because if they don't, they will not have food. And so we look at here that we, in our learning here in, is about planning. It's about keeping focus no matter what comes our way. God is a God of structure and order. Is that right? Amen. He doesn't do things haphazardly. There is a plan. There is a strategy of how he works together. And we just need to look at the account of creation for us to see this, to see his master design. It is important that we do not let the challenges of, the, of this world distract us from what our higher calling is. Because there's always going to be a lot of distractions. If we look at meerkats, I love meerkats. They weigh less than one kilo, but they can run faster than any of you in the room. 32 kilometres per hour. Their main predators are eagles that come from the sky, and then you've got snakes. So they actually have to be careful from above and, and below. And that's why they have their meerkats. They've all got a role. They live together, they hunt together, and they have mutual trust. And they have to. They always have one, one meerkat looking out, watching. I just went to Dubbo Zoo recently before the floods had come in, just October, the weekend of October, a uh, long weekend. And it was amazing just to see the beautiful meerkats and see the animals more out in nature. I think that's how they should, should be. Um, out in nature, or at least with a lot of space. Uh, but it was interesting to see them there. But one member of the mob is assigned the job of the guard while, while the others feed. What happens if they get a bit lazy? What if they don't uh, attend that day? What happens if, for example, they take a toilet break at the wrong time? The responsibility is vast, as one mistake can result in a life and death situation. You and I cannot grow or achieve our mission unless we work together and share the load. So our learning here is working together and sharing the load. When we look at the uh, Pareto's principle, are you familiar with this principle? Okay. Well, before the unprecedented times that we've gone through, the world had experienced, all of us had experienced, we saw you know, roughly about, when I go to church to church, 80% of the people, uh, are they doing the work? I can see some, how, how many would it be? Roughly about 20% of the people, would that sound more like it? Doing all the work in the church. Is that a problem? <clears throat> Imagine if we put God first and we were all fulfilled and we all fulfilled God's plan in our life. What would this look like? God wants us to live the abundant life in him. Is it fair that 20% of the people, and obviously after these unprecedented, unprecedented times when I was in South Queensland, the members were telling me that it's even less now. What do you think here? 20% of the people doing all the work in the church. What are your thoughts? In South Queensland, they told me it was less. Why is that? Because not everybody's back. Have you ever wondered why bees are so noisy? Do you know how many times they flap their wings? They flap, they beat their wings 11,400 times in, what do you think, one month? One week? One hour, one minute. We do serve. Uh, we are really fearfully and wonderfully made, aren't we? While the cream might be higher in the hive hierarchy, every bee has, it, has its purpose. Every member of the swarm knows their role and responsibilities, and they have to cooperate together for success. Everyone has a role to play. 
from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes what? Growth of the body for edifying of itself and in love. Do we want our church to grow? Amen. Oh, how long did that take? Do we want our church to grow? Yes. yes. And that means everybody needs to get involved in any different way. You know, sometimes we think, oh, you know, uh, I can only do this. But you know what? It's like, for example, the greeters, where we're running a, a program in, in Parramatta at the moment, uh, in archaeology, Back to the Future, and the greeters make such a difference. The AV people make such a difference. The people who are doing the hospitality, the, people, the person who's, who's sharing the message. If we don't have one of those, those groups of people, will it still work? Will it still flow well? No, we need everybody to get in there. Imagine what we could achieve if there were no pew warmers. Do you know what a pew warmer is? We come to church once a week and that's all we do. What are your thoughts about that? We don't want to be a club. This is not about being a club. This is about getting people ready for Jesus coming. Amen. Because we all want to be there, right? Do we all want to be there? Yeah? And so if we, if we all get involved, it would happen. Think about this. If everyone in here brought one person, in, the, in our worldwide church of 20 million, if every person brought one person to Jesus this year, and then next year, everybody, including all the new people, brought one person to, to Jesus that year, and the next year, and the next year, how many years do you think it would take to share the message to the rest of the world? It's less than 10. How serious are you about going home? How serious? Because if we're going to treat God's work as a once a week, and I'm not talking to people who are doing much more than that. But I'm just saying, if we do think just once a week for God, do you think we're really putting, are we really putting God first? What do you think? It's a strong message. But do you think it has to be said? Who would love to go home in 10 years? Who would love there to be no crying, no pain, no suffering. Ten years. It takes each one of us to do our part. I love this verse. I planted. What happens next? Oh, dear. Let's go. Let's go with a bit of energy here. I planted. But who gave the increase? But God gave the increase. You have a sphere of influence, a circle of work, colleagues, friends, family. That is unique. I don't know who you know. I may never meet the people that you know, but you will. You do. And what's interesting here, imagine if it was your smile, your prayer, those uplifting words, that Bible verse, that Bible study was one of the key reasons that helped that individual to be there in heaven. Is that important? Amen. You know, sometimes we think we have to do all these things, but it's the everyday things is, God, how can I be a blessing today? Bring me the people. Help me to go out to the people. Bring someone new that I can connect with. Finally, all of you, be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. Be courteous. Are we courteous in the church? Are we courteous just when it suits us? You know, I, I, if, if, if I was to go to your home... What would your family say? If you were to go to my home, 
What would my family say about me? It's not what we just do on the outside, right? It's what we do also in our family home. Our parents, our children, our friends, our loved ones. How do we show this compassion? Because what's interesting too, I remember there was some, Muhammad Gandhi, Gandhi said, I, he would have been a Christian if it wasn't for all the Christians. Christians. What is he saying there? But he actually believed the message, but he wasn't seeing it in the people. Isn't that what Christ said? People will know from the love that we have for one another. So I'm just going to go back here. Uh, so how can we become an even more loving church? How do we care for one another? You know, when I look, I mean, I'm in the area of, I work in the area of health these days. Didn't always used to. I was working in business, working in banking for many, many years, insurance, etc. here and also in the United Kingdom. But it, this is interesting here. Non-communicable diseases are largely prevented. 89%, that's 9 out of 10 people in Australia are dying from non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, cancer and cardiac. Obesity, for example. And what's interesting is also, I noticed you've got the, the program about Connect, about mental health. We're seeing the mental health figures before COVID was 586 million people have been diagnosed of having anxiety or depression. That was before COVID. You know, when we had the first month of COVID, that had, in Australia, they believed it went up by 25%. Okay? And so it's interesting that before mental health was a bit of a taboo, we didn't talk too much about it, but now all of us have been affected in some way. Many health systems worldwide face the challenge of reigning the unsustainable health costs. Because if you think about the global trend of you know, non-communicable diseases, who's higher, the world or Australia? What do you think? Australia. The world, NCDs is about 70%, and in Australia and New Zealand, it's about 90%, 89 to 90%. What's happening here with our lifestyle? Helping individuals make positive choices is a shared responsibility about our physicians, other healthcare workers, healthcare systems, and the patients. You see here, the business of hospitals and hospital systems is that it's focusing here on, you know, they, they call it healthcare, but I'm gonna be a little bit cheeky and I'm going to call it, it's more like illness care. Because I need to be sick before I get covered. Right? I'm not going to mention any names or anything like that. But basically, there is no real incentive for you to be healthy in the first place. And so, because the healthcare system doesn't cover those things. But it is so much cheaper if we do it this way. So how can we help? God has given us a special instruction. He foresaw how our church could be more loving, and relevant in the community. In Testimonies to the Church, volume three, it says, I was again, by Ellen White, I was again shown that the health reform is one of the branch of the great work, which is to fit a people for the coming of the Lord. It is as closely connected with the third angel's message as the, as the hand is with the body. Those who proclaim the message should teach health reform also. It is a subject that we must understand in order be, to be prepared for the events that are close upon us. And it should have a prominent place. Satan and his angels are seeking to hinder this work of reform and will do all they can to perplex and burden those who are heartily engaged in it. Yet none should be discouraged at this or cease their efforts because of it. What are your thoughts about that? Do you agree with that? 
Yeah? So I have a dream. And I'll be a Martin Luther dream, but I have a dream. And it's an audacious dream. Are you ready for it? Oh, you're a bit quiet. Are you ready for it? Yes. Okay. Do you want to hear it? Yes. Okay. All right. Then I've got your permission. So if you're unhappy, then I'll quickly leave afterwards. Okay. This is my dream. I've got three points here. Every pastor and member in the church embraces discipleship and the medical missionary work to save lives. What do you think? Yes. Every pastor, every member. It's not about health doing work over here and then outreach work is over here. It's a combined, united work. And Jesus went about all the cities and the villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with... Compassion. We are to be moved by compassion when we see people who are not well because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep have no shepherd. You know, one lady at our kids' club, we call it kids' club because we have many um, people from the community. Actually, there's two from members and the rest are all community uh, and many Hindus. Uh, But on Sabbath... You know, we were, we were having it and they came for the first time. And then later on, we invited her and her children back to our place, which is socially connected. Then we went after church another time. We went for our Sabbath walks in the afternoon because we're very blessed to have whole Parramatta Park right next to us, literally 100 metres away from where we are. And now I'm studying the Bible with her. She wanted connection. She wanted to have her children looked after, to have people encourage her family. She wanted to get out and do exercise. She wanted to belong. And now she's studying the Word of God. This is the ministry of Jesus. It's not one thing over here, one thing over there. There should be a combined plan within the church. And so when we genuinely care and love people, the Holy Spirit opens their heart. And as he opens their heart, he continues to open our own heart. Then, thus the Saviour has bound together the work of preaching the truth and healing the sick. And we are never to divorce them. Christ blended ministry and healing And there is to be no separation in our work then than there was in his. My next point here is every church and school to become a wellness hub and uses all ministries to promote wholeness of life and wellness. What do you think? Do you think our schools should be healthy schools? Should they have healthy plant-based foods in the canteens? What about our churches? So let me talk to you about wellness hubs. What is this? So before I begin that, uh, Trudy just asked me to share a little bit on ELIA. ELIA stands for Empowering Lifestyle Innovation Advocates. It also means Jehovah is God in Hebrew. It now comes under Adventist Healthcare. So they have, we are now, ELIA Wellness is a sister organisation to the Sydney Adventist Hospital. And the aim of Earlier Wellness is to equip you with tools to reach the community and take them on a journey of whole person health with programs, resources, etc. So we meet people where they are at. So this wellness hub concept is that we have, we actually have more churches than Kentucky Fried Chicken in Australia. Did you know that? We have more churches, more outlets than Kentucky Fried Chicken. But how are we using them? Wouldn't it be amazing if every church became a wellness hub where people were coming during the week 
for different activities. You've got this amazing kitchen here. I'm sure you're doing cooking classes and things like that. But amazing things that people could come in the community where we are known for the place to be for whole person health, for community. And so this is what it's about. It's about promoting evidence-based whole person health for the benefit of the community. It's about serving the community and it's looking at these seven dimensions of emotionally thriving, which is mental health, physically energised, which is your diet, exercise, sleep, NCDs, socially connected, which is the community. Vocationally enriched is about having a heart of service. Spiritually empowered is about sharing that message and the compassion from Jesus. Intellectually engaged, having a mindset of love for learning, neuroplasticity, environmentally attuned, getting out in nature. What a beautiful day it is today. You know, getting out in nature, going for the walks, getting the fresh air, the vitamin Ds, etc. So this is the seven areas that we're focusing on is to really help us to live our best life. What do you think? Do you think it makes sense? So our goal by 2025 is to have 100 wellness hubs across Australia and New Zealand. What do you think? I told you it's audacious goals. Consider we had zero a few, uh, last year we had zero. This is a new concept, a new idea, a new plan. And we're wanting to have 100. Do you know how many we've got now? 21. From last year to this year. And I believe this can grow. And this is really, it's not about having big buildings and all the rest, it's about using our existing buildings for the blended ministry. That's what it's about. What can we do that we're not a one day a week event? Yeah? A place to connect, a place that brings health, healing and hope. I want to share with you this picture here. Can you see that? This is our first mobile wellness hub. And this is actually a food truck in Geelong. One of the pastors there, Pastor Jeremy, he, um, he's been working with me and, and his team. <clears throat> and he said, Geraldine, I really want to do a food truck where I can go out and I can go to place to place and I can make an impact. I can work with Adra as well. And so I said, yeah, let's trial it. But you know what, I'd love to see one of these in every single conference. Could you imagine having a food truck that went to place to place? You know, we just had Gratisney Conference. Some of you, oh, I'm not sure, there may be a few people from here who might have been there. But we actually had, just recently, uh, Dr. Christiana Lamina, who works for the Gratisney Conference. She's the health director there, but she also works with us, with Elia, a couple of days a week. And she organised the Homebush Health Expo. Uh, for us to be part of that. And so this was a health expo at Homebush that was uh, from the community. And we, and she actually booked in two booths for Elia. And we ran the big Elia wellness snapshot there. And she thought that there might be about 50 people. Guess how many came past our booths and did the health assessment? That's right, you were there. That's where I recognise your face, Tyler. Was it busy? It was packed. Mariancy was there as well. And it was, it was amazing to be able to connect with so many people from the community and have follow-up. And we had people come to our programs, dinner with the doctors afterwards at Wallara. Uh, we had people from come to Parramatta. We had people come to Runga because of that event. And this is what we want to do more of. Uh, when we look at this here, we developed a digital app, a website, um, and so what you can do here is you can actually go on. And the reason why we did this is because we were, when I first started, I went around and I asked, what do you want? I've just joined the health area. What would you want? And when I spoke to the doctors, churches, health professionals, they said, Jordan, we want a one place that we can go to for, help, for reliable, evidence-based health information that had our Adventist health message in there, but done in a really friendly w way that was uh, inviting to the community. We could, whatever was there, we believed in it. Because sometimes you go to different websites, what happens? This is really good and, ooh, watch that part. Has that happened to you? 
And so this is what we do. So now what we have the ability to do is you can go and get your assessments done. There's loads of hundreds of uh, articles there that are evidence-based. You can run programs on there. Live More Project, which is a mental health, as Trudy said. We've now got um, Elia Fitness that you can do. So you can have you can do exercise anywhere at home. We also have Distress and Thrive to help with stress. So we've looked at the things that are that, uh, that is what the community is looking for. And then we've just got a new one, which is spiritually well, spiritual wellness here. And you've got recipes, and you can set up your community groups on there as well. Because really what we want them to do is, to, what's the postcode for Stamil? So we want there to be 2074 when someone puts in, or they probably would put in the Stamil, okay? We want there to be lots of activities happening in this area. Because if we have sign, if we have people coming on to the site, which we were sharing, we've got 9,000 plus people now on our um, on our app now, or members on our platform, and this is pretty amazing, right? Because we just started a couple of few years ago. Our goal is to have 50,000 by 2025. Do you think we can do it? We can only do it if everybody gets involved, right? But if we did that, we would have more people on the platform than people attending our church on a Sabbath. And so we're wanting to be able to go far and wide in health because people are interested in health more than ever before. But we don't want to just give them health. We wanted to give them the whole person health message. What do you say? So this here is, um, this is the Greater Sydney Conference. They had a health expo. Uh, Health Network Expo that Dr. Christiana Lamino was organising. You can see Angela Saunders there at the back. And there's a lady there that Mariancy and I know because um, she was studying the Bible but with us. And what was interesting was that when she actually went to this event, and I wasn't sure if I should put, bring it to this because it was so new. She was very, pretty new. But I said, you know what, why don't you come check it out and see what other things we do because we actually have a full message not just the spiritual, but we've got the health message as well. So she came there for the whole day and she absolutely loved it. And uh, earlier this year, she gave her heart to Jesus. And now she's getting involved with helping us with our uh, outreach programs, etc. And you know, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes commitment, it takes study, it takes a genuine love. Is that right? So when we look at these things here, this is uh, in September, this is, I went to the Trans-Pacific Union Mission and, and the SPD event as health, we partnered together, and this, what you're seeing here is the 10,000 Toes Wellness Summit. And we had Elia Fitness up there, they were doing the exercises, you can see them doing all these moves. And uh, you know what's interesting, we, we were planning to have 500 people. And then, uh, Dr., uh, so George Kwong, the TPU, Trans-Pacific Union Mission, Health Director Associate, he said, Jordan, I think we're going to have 580. But they were catering for everybody. It's a three-day session. We do the same thing here. We're going to have an Elia Wellness Summit at the Sydney Adventist Hospital Clinical Education Centre next year on the 24th to the 26th of March. But here, they were having it at Fulton College. Next thing you know, does that look like 500 people to you? All of a sudden, we had a 1,000 people registered that day and that came in, pastors, Fiji mission presidents, secretary, everybody was coming along. And so uh, we had a lot more people to cater for. But it's a good problem to have, isn't it? But nobody went hungry and that's the main thing. But it was inspiring because what are they doing over there? They're bringing personal ministries together, ministerial ministries together, women's ministry, health ministries, youth ministry, and they're bringing it all together. And I was so excited because when we actually did the 10,000 Toes, which is an initiative of the Seventh Adventist Church here at SPD, um, to the Pacific, which is looking at non-communicable diseases and how to help the people there in the Pacific. And what was really interesting was that there was Six of the pe- six people who actually won the Ten Thousand Toes Award were young adults. How do we help the young adults? Getting them involved, plugging them into the system. Because if we don't do that, they'll plug into another system. And so this is really important here. But you can see them here, and they were giggling away. Why? 
because they hadn't done these moves. And I said to them, if you're going to be doing this wellness summit and we're going to be doing all of this and you're going to be going out and sharing the health message, I said, well, some of us, we've got to get a bit fit. And so they were doing these moves at the front, some of the pastors there, uh, and they had a really great time. When I shared this with my husband, he said to me, Jordan, look at this. It reminds it reminded him of the breathing exercises that they used to do in front of the sanitary on Battle Creek. In a few weeks' time, we'll be launching uh, Elia Fitness to the Sydney Adventures Hospital for staff. You know, we, and and uh, in November will be the, the real launch. But we're going to have, we we're praying that the weather will be well, will be good for us, but um, to actually have people exercising on the front lawn again. What do you think? It's a beautiful front lawn. And I'd love to see all the staff coming out and doing exercises with us. So number three, we have lifestyle medicine centres, wellness centres in strategic locations and partner with the government, businesses, NGOs to bring health, healing, hope to all people. We can't finance everything ourselves. We need to partner together. What do you think? And it was interesting because after I presented at the 10,000 Toes Wellness Summit, see this lady here in the middle? I don't know if this is going to work up here. It might not, but the lady here, Dr. this is on the far right, it's Dr. Aquila. Our, we just opened, we opened up a few years ago a wellness centre there in Fiji. He's now the medical director. And Dr. Davina Nand is from the Ministry of Health. Uh, and so we were talking to her and then Pam Townen, who helps lead the 10,000 Toes for me. But what was really exciting here was that we are now meeting with Fiji Ministry of Health and we're looking at how we can use their existing facilities to have our 10,000 Toes Wellness Hubs in those areas. And so we're now looking at um, a memorandum of an understanding that we can work together. And so we can get our message out far and wide and that they will recognise our wellness hubs to send patients to so that we can offer these health programs and resources that people can go there, walking clubs, community clubs, etc., cooking demonstrations. And from that, what does that mean? Our church becomes relevant. What do you think? Amen. Should we do that here? Amen. Or should we just do that in the Pacific only? We need to do both. We actually have, I have the same strategy almost for here and over there, but it's just contextualised, yeah? Because at the end of the day, it's about all of us coming together, working and promoting whole person health message, which includes the spirituality component. So this is one of the resources that we just uh, finished developing a few months ago called Empowered and Purposeful Living, Seven Steps Towards... Oh, here we go. Seven steps towards? Oh, wow. I don't think I'd be a very good conductor here. So seven steps towards? And? Okay. And so there's seven topics there that you can see. Gratitude, values, emotional intelligence, resilience, kindness and generosity, purpose and meaning, and hope and optimism. I'm actually running this at the moment on Wednesday nights and uh, Emildra is actually attending that online with me. So our goal is to empower people to whole person health and to, sh and to share this unique message. And that's why we've created this, where this is a spiritual program. We still focus on the health. We have a story. We focus on the health. And then from there, we talk, you use an illustration from the Bible. We talk about that as well, the illustration. So I'll give you an example. When we talk about gratitude, the illustration is talking about the 10 lepers. Why did one of them come back? What happened to the other nine? And so we actually go through the Bible verses in this. And then we look at the science as well. So I just wanted to share this with you. How many of you watched, the, watched some of the Olympics last year? Yeah? Do you remember there was this lady called Nicola McDermott who was the high jumper? She, was a, she won the silver medal for high jump. Well, I asked her, we asked her, and I thank you for Ventus Media's help too, to be part of this program and to share her thoughts on hope and optimism. And I wanted to share that with you today. What I love about high jump is that 
It's challenging mentally, but it's also challenging physically. I just love it. I really enjoy high jumping. So I was the longest baby born in the hospital that I was born in. So I was already um, being different from the moment I was born. I'm right now six foot two and I stopped growing at 14. In school, I found it quite difficult because I was so different. It was hard to make friends. Um, there's either that, oh, she's different, let's get to meet you, or she's different, we're going to exclude her. And I found that, that the second option was my lifestyle. I remember when mum and dad, they put me into little athletics because all of a sudden I was really, really good at that particular sport. It gave me an outlet for somewhere where I could thrive. So as soon as I was good with high jump, people would say, you're tall. I'm like, yeah, but I'm good at high jump. So I really clung to sport as my, not only my identity, but almost um, something in the toolbox in order to get friends and, um, and survive. My coach and I, we had this big 10 year plan that if you stay with me for 10 years, we'll be jumping two meters. I started having people encouraging me all around me saying, I think you're going to be an Olympic medalist and I think you're going to be an Olympian. And I wanted to experience that world championships and that, that travel aspect. You want to be the best of the best. That sort of built in me a, a passion and a hunger to just keep training and keep um, perfecting that craft. I was overseas at the time and I had everything that I dreamed of when I was a kid. I was training with um, a squad that was an Olympic level. I had um, an Olympic coach. I was best facilities in the world and I thought it doesn't get better than this. And unfortunately, the dreams that we have for ourselves, we can make it that we're, I'm going to be satisfied once I'm, I reach here but I found myself so dissatisfied. I was in an environment where people dream to have those opportunities and I had them, but God wasn't in it. I had scaled my way to the top of what I thought was the fulfillment of my dreams, but it was emptiness. I, I found that people that were at the top, they, they didn't have that passion or that, that holistic life that I dreamed of and what I'd been brought up in the school with. I found that I was more satisfied when I was at youth group in the days where we were worshipping God and just having fun and playing around than me being in the best facilities and reaching my dream. And I, I had that crossroads of going, do I want to follow the path that I'm leading on, which I feel like my faith right now is just decreasing day by day, or do I turn and just go to God and that might mean leaving all of this behind but I'm willing to and I decided in in that moment at around 20 years old no I'd, I'd I've gone after this life for longer like longer than half my life at that stage I'd been following that pursuit of sport and I decided to lay that down and I left that all behind and came back to Australia and that's where God actually said, I want you to go back into the sport, but this time do it my way. And it was in that moment, that crossroads, that I gave up some things and I was fully surrendered to whatever God wanted me to do. And that's when my identity completely was based off who God says I was and seeking Him rather than anything that sport could give me. So Tokyo Olympic Games, I qualified for it in 2019 and that year in 2021, at the start of it, I become the first Australian woman to jump two metres and it breaks the athletics world, at least in Australia. And they say, maybe she'll be an Olympic medalist. And that, that just sort of blew everyone's mind because I thought, I think it was the 1960s when we had our last Olympic medal in high jump for the women. And when I went into the stadium that day, it was unshakable. Because I had nothing to hide, I'd already given it all to God. And the confidence and the freedom that I had, I knew that um, in Tokyo, that people would see something different. I just jumped in the freedom that I knew I could jump. And once I cleared two meters, I was in the gold medal position. 
but I wasn't going to stop. I knew that I'd already reached the Olympic medal stage, but we we're going for gold. And then I just missed 204, which would have been a massive personal best. But I left the bags um, thinking, oh my goodness, you've just done a silver Olympic medal jump. Like you, you've, you've won a medal. And the joy that I experienced in that moment was, was incredible. Sometimes in high jump, you'll just make all the bars and you win all these great competitions. But 90% of the times it's me missing bars and being frustrated, right? <laughs> Why can't I do this? And then overcoming it. But I can have that optimism that since I'm seeking God, I have the key to life and life abundant. And then if I have that hope, that optimism comes because no one can take away the most precious thing in my life. I can't do anything in order to gain it or lose it. It's just the love of God is given to me and that's, that's secure and that stays the same. Isn't it beautiful? I spent, I was, uh, had the privilege of spending time with her whilst we were filming, etc. And she's just such a beautiful person. And it's interesting because she was telling me that, you know, before she was doing Bible studies, there wasn't that many people in her group. Now that she's won the Olympic medal, they had like 50 people. It can't even fit the people in, the, in, the, in their home. But what's exciting about this is that she was willing to work together for us to produce a resource that we can share with the committee. What do you think? Do you think this is relevant to people? Yes. There will be distractions that come our way. There'll be natural disasters, there'll be more pestilences, there'll be pandemics, etc. Issues will come up in the church. Different views will be voiced uh, by our congregation, but this should not paralyze the church. This is the time to be focused. This is the time to work together. This is the time not to slumber. We have a unique healing of health healing and hope. With nine deaths in Australia, I could go around the room and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And nine, on average, will die here from NCDs, unless we're doing something different. We have a message to help them. And this helps us to be more loving to the community. Our eyes should be fixed on Jesus. What do you say? Amen. And there'll be people in heaven because what God's done through you. Amen. I want to invite you to be part of the church that God intended it to be. One that loves the Lord, our God, with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength, and with all our mind and your neighbour as yourself. I know life gets busy. If you look at my calendar, it's looking pretty busy, isn't it, Marianne? <laughs> but my prayer is that I will continue to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus. Amen. How many of you here today say, God, I know life gets busy, but help me to, be, to fulfil the dream that you have for me? How many of you wouldn't say that? Thank you. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we serve such an almighty God, a God that loves us, that cares for us, Lord, and hears our every thought, our every word. Lord, we pray, Lord, that we will be the church that you want us to be, that each person here, Lord, will be touched, Lord, by you, your message, Lord, and Lord, that you inspire them and help them each day. And Lord, we pray, Lord, for the day where we will see you face to face, Lord, with all the people, Lord, that you put in our pathway, Lord, to bring to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.